everyone, thank you for choosing to watch another video from this channel. Today I'm going to talk about polysorbate 80 and uh, I already made one video on about the polysorbate 60 and the link is available and uh, so today I'm going to talk about polysorbate 80. So what I have here is a polysorbate 20, polysorbate 60 and polysorbate 80. Uh, these are emulsifying agents and they are used in uh, food industry, pharmaceutical and cosmetic. And uh, they probably come in the food grade or uh, cosmetic grade or pharmaceutical grade or even analytical, uh, analytical grades. Uh, they are, these polysorbates are made from uh, sorbitol mixed with the certain number of moles of ethylene oxide and plus the fatty acids. And now there's a concern about the polysorbates uh, that the residual ethylene oxide could cause cancer. And this is quite true. Uh, ethylene oxide is a reactive molecule that undergoes SN2 reaction and it could bind to DNA. So uh, the food grade of polysorbate, polysorbates probably have very tight criteria on the residual ethylene oxide. So I'm going to go back to my computer and show you some slide uh, on polysorbate 80, talk about the molecular structure and how you can do the quantitation of this excipient in, in, uh, in your task, that is reverse engineering of the product. Uh, okay, talk to you soon. Uh, polysorbate 80 is a mixture of par uh, partially esterified uh, fatty acid, mainly oleic acid, and it is uh, mixed with the sorbitol and the 20 moles of ethylene oxide to give this uh, emulsifying agent called polysorbate 80. Uh, now, the polysorbate 80 is a compendial excipient. It has a USP monograph. And the, in the USP monograph, it, is, um, is a, it has a picture of the molecular structure of the excipients with the test methods and the criteria. So there is an assay method for composition of fatty acids. And in this uh, table in the USP, it says that the, uh, uh, the amount of oleic acid cannot be less than 58% weight per weight. Also in the table, it describes that the uh, amount of other fatty acid that, that could be present and the amount cannot be more than certain levels. Um, so for the purpose of the qualitative and quantitative analysis of this excipient, I'm going to talk about USP, uh, the GC method, and also I'm going to talk about the HPLC with MS slash ELST detector that is a very nice publication by a Zhang Group. So I'm gonna talk about uh, that publication. Now, as I said, the, the polysorbate AD quantitation with the HPLC uh, ELST MS detector, there is a paper by Zhang Group and uh, published in the Journal of Medicine. Um, now, in this paper, they describe the process of making fatty acid, that the first step is the dehydration of sorbitol to make sorbitan. And uh, the paper describes that in, the in this process, uh, uh, it is possible that we have a double hydration uh, to get the isosorbate uh, uh, molecule. Now, the next step is the addition of fatty acid. In the case of now, polysorbate 80, we are talking about oleic acid, followed by addition of the ethylene oxide. Now, again, in the case of polysorbate 80, we are talking about 20 moles of ethylene oxide to be added. So, in this paper, it describes that this process does not give you a homogeneous molecule or compound. It actually gives you a heterogeneous mix and there are possibility of forming at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different molecules that you will have different uh, level of, um, let's say, uh, the fatty uh, acid formation. You could uh, maybe mono substituted, di-substituted, or tri-substituted, or maybe there is free 
sorbitol or isosorbate molecules present. Uh, so this is a very nice uh, picture of polysorbate uh, potential molecules that you could have in the mix. It is quite nice, in, in my opinion. Now, uh, the, this also applies to any polysorbate molecules. So in this process, if, you're, if you are talking about polysorbate 20 or polysorbate 60, it is very much possible that similar uh, different composition could present. Uh, just the difference is that the, the fatty acid content would be different. Uh, again, this picture provides a very nice chromatography of polysorbate 80, and then it gives you the peaks called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it also, uh, actually in this figure, uh, they have two different chromatography conditions. One of them only gives you B and a C and A. The other one did not elute. Uh, the other one, uh, the, the condition on the top actually elutes all these uh, molecules. And they are all assigned to, let's say, uh, peak A is assigned to the free uh, sorbitan or isosorbate without any fatty acid. And the other ones are like monosubstituted or uh, disubstituted or trisubstituted. Now, in the case of uh, your reverse engineering uh, task, uh, maybe you are trying to figure out uh, which, uh, exip uh, which type of polysorbate 80 uh, you need to, uh, let let's uh, purchase. Uh, now, the challenge is that the, depending on who's manufacturing the polysorbate 80, you will have different composition of these molecules in your reference product. So, uh, the easy way is that to just figure out how much polysorbate 80 you have, but the real challenge is that not only know how much polysorbate 80 you have in your reference product, but also who was the manufacturer of the excipients. So this uh, chromatography or the condition that Zhang is providing would enable you to actually pinpoint the manufacturer of uh, your uh, excipients. And um, it, now it is possible that for your task of reverse engineering, it is really not that important, like who made polysorbate 80. Maybe the amount is good enough. But in some, some cases, actually, your chances of uh, getting the approval of passing a clinical study in, improves significantly if you actually pinpoint the manufacture of these excipients. Uh, now, uh, the next one is the USB polysorbate 80 monograph, uh, that is a GC method. This is a rather easier way of doing the quantitation. And in the monograph, uh, it describes how you do the uh, sulfonication and you just break up the fatty acids from your polysorbate 80. And then you do the methylation and then you do a G use a GC method to figure out how much of these fatty acids you have. And then you have to do your calculation and then you will get some. Uh, now, this slide gives some information of the GC method that um, uh, it recommends to use a DB VAX or VAX column, like a G16 is a VAX column, with the uh, oven parameters. And um, it is a very good idea to use these parameters and um, it is improves uh, your chances of uh, having a method which is very specific uh, rather than having the peaks coalute. Now, this is a chromat chromatography uh, generated by the condition that I showed previously or something similar to it. And then we see the peak, uh, which is C18, uh, like a C18 meaning uh, your oleic acid at this dot one means like a singly uh, unsaturated bond, one unsaturated bond. And then you have the residual of other fatty acid, like a steric acid, like C18, with no double bonds, or C18 with the two double bonds, or C16, like I believe it's just palmitic acid, or methyl palmitate in this case. So you need to add up all these peaks, and then you will have the uh, information to calculate how much uh, polysorbate 80 you had in your reference product. Uh, now, this slide has some information about the polysorbate 80 uh, RID limit uh, from the website. And as I recall, there are at least 
AD interest of uh, for the polysorbid AD. Uh, so that that tells that how popular this excipient is in the pharmaceutical dosage forms. So again, for the product that you're reverse engineering, you must go to the IAD limit, IAD website and check for the maximum allowed uh, of this excipient in your dosage form that you are doing reverse engineering. And also the Health Canada has a website on the uh, allowable amount of polysorbate 80 uh, in the food products. And overall, the, the limits are quite small. And as I said in my previous video, uh, these polysorbates uh, taste horrible. Uh, the best I can describe it is just, uh, uh, I don't want to use rotten wood, but it is kind of like, like you're chewing on a piece of wood. That's how they taste like. So you, even if they increase the amount of these excipients in the food products, you, you're going to end up having a product that it is, uh, it doesn't taste good at all. Uh, the references are FDA, USP, NF, and also the beautiful uh, paper by the Zhang team that actually gives us a very good insight on what we are dealing with with these uh, homogeneous products. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you like this video, I appreciate you push a like button. And um, if you have any experience working with this XCPN, I appreciate you write a comment. Thank you very much and have a good time. Bye.